Hi everybody, it's John here from Planet Cambo with Ryan and James from the Planet Cambo team here for another Frogcast to keep you engaged during this lockdown period. And today we're going to talk about the apparent phasing out of lockdown and maybe things slowly starting to return to normal and how that's going to impact us in general and how we think things are going to sort of pan out which i think everybody's you know eagerly looking forward to that that time and tonight there's going to be an announcement um this is it's sunday the 10th of may and tonight there is apparently going to be an announcement by the prime minister about the next phase of this lockdown period and we're all eagerly awaiting to to find out what he's going to say um, so yeah, let's, let's kick it off. Uh, Ryan. What yeah. Do you think? So, um, I mean, from what we know so far, we haven't had the announcement yet, but, um, the general kind of atmosphere and feel around it is that, um, there's going to be a slow rollback of these restrictions that have been put in place. So we're all based in the UK here and, um, some of the government messaging that's been going out has been stay home, save lives uh, and protect the NHS. And the uh, stay home messaging is going to change to stay alert, which means um, keep, keep your social distance, stay at home if possible and wash your hands um, as much as possible to kind of just be aware and conscious of not spreading the virus around. So we're all kind of looking forward to that because um, we've had a bank holiday weekend on Friday and leading into this weekend and it was really nice weather. And I think a lot of people um, judging by going outside and seeing that there were a lot of people out and they were kind of just kind of, you know, I mean, we're only supposed to be going out for an hour of exercise technically, but there is a lot of people just out generally kind of enjoying the weather. I think everyone was a bit fed up with the restrictions in place. So it would be good to um, finally see a rollback of those restrictions. Yeah, Lucia and I went out yesterday, just do a bit of shopping and I could feel a difference in that there was more people out and there seemed less, there was less people wearing masks. And also when inside the shops, there wasn't so much of this two meters, even though it's still there, it, it, people weren't, you know, like moving away from you in the way that they were before. So it felt more relaxed to me, just, you know, just going out the last couple of days, it felt a bit more, bit more relaxed and a bit more normal than it has been which felt good but there, there's a bit of fatigue towards the restrictions i would say say and people are kind of just you know but i mean yeah they're, they're still obeying rules but like you say a bit more lax and relaxed yeah and i think because they've said that what we've you know the, the the lockdown is has been successful that we've passed the peak and the number of uh, reported cases are down or the admissions to hospitals are down. So I think people are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, which is, which is really nice. And yeah, it's weird. I, I, I kind of got used to it. I think yeah. you just got, I think in it, as a human being in any, any situation that you're put into after a few weeks or months, you just get used to it, whatever it is, you just adjust. So You've, I've just got used to this situation and yes, I miss things being normal, but at the same time, having a rest from everything has also been nice. It's been, you know, not, I mean, I do miss, you know, like we've had to stop our, our group activities, our live activities, and I do miss it. But at the same time, having a break for six weeks, or however long it's been, has also been quite pleasant to not have a responsibility of, you know, going to run a ceremony every Sunday and, and running a live event on a Thursday and things like that. So, but I do think that when this, this does relax, 
everybody's so eager to get back to normal that there's going to be a surge in all different kinds of activities, leisure activities, cambo, all these things. I think there's going to be a massive, massive surge where people are going to start really, you know, letting off some steam and, and, and doing these things that they, that they haven't been able to do, which I think will be good for the businesses that survive this, yeah. this situation. I mean, w w one other thing to add on to that, I, I did find it interesting. I saw a clip of um, a government minister kind of talking about, you know, what uh, rolling these restrictions back would look like. And he, he used the specific example of, um, you know, something like a McDonald's drive through could, uh, could be feasible as part of a rollback because he, you know, as long as people are two metres away from each other while soup serving food and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of these restaurants opening up again, kind of drive through facilities and that kind of stuff. But um, again, like you say, for the businesses that survive, because uh, we're, we're still waiting to see the fallout from a lot of this. And um, I, I, I just wonder about the airlines, quite frankly, because uh, a, lot, a lot of countries still have border controls in place. And um, I wonder how long they're going to survive. The government has said that they're going to give them kind of backing and help them out. But um, I think Virgin Atlantic have already kind of announced that they're in trouble. So, I mean, what you were saying about the drive-through, that the, there's a B&Q near me and they've been operating a, a drive-through kind of thing since the beginning of lockdown, as far as I know, in that you can't go into the store, but you can do click and collect. So you can order stuff online and turn up in your car. And when I walk past it, I see they've got all cones and it's all laid out so people can, you know, can turn up and just get something given to them in their car. So I actually don't see why restaurants couldn't, like McDonald's drive throughs couldn't have done that as well. I don't know, but. Well, in, the, in the States, they didn't lock things down, down um, to that extent. Well, I, I think it depends which state you're in, but I spoke to someone in North Carolina and they were kind of surprised that a lot of our restaurants had closed down because that was still open for them and they were doing the drive through thing, so yeah. <clears throat> James, it sounded like you uh, were going to say something there. Well, I was going to say there's, there, there are a lot of restaurants that I've noticed that are still doing, that have, that have um, converted into doing takeaway. So they're still operating, but they're operating under a different format. Um, but I was thinking about what John was saying about the difference recently in the how it feels outside. Because I've noticed that as well, that I've noticed that there's, there are more people in parks. There are, there's still social distancing, but there are more people. The numbers have, have totally changed to how they were a month ago. Less masks. I think there's a general sense in the air of people wanting to, to experience outside more. And there's the, I mean, a number of my friends have talked about this, the, what the impact on people's general mental well health well-being sorry is in a situation like this where you're confined most of the time to your to, to you know to your own home and particularly for people you know in urban big urban centers where often folks don't have outside spaces to go into this what the what the ramifications or consequences might be once we once we come out of this or whether as part of this easing process which might be i mean i've read that it may be that if there's an extension on how many times we're allowed to go out. So we're allowed to go out more than once for exercise and whether that will help to kind of taper off some of that, um, you know, residue for people. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think the, the mental well-being is, is definitely an issue um, because we are social animals and, uh, <laughs> It is, it is kind of depressing, um, you know, being in this situation and just socialising in some form yeah. makes, it makes us feel good. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, again, I think once this, once this relaxes, I think there'll be a huge surge in, yeah. in people socialising and doing social activities, which is great, and it, sh it should be that way. Um, 
but we'll have to wait and see. I wonder what the the um, I was reading something in the in the in the papers the other day about the you know the the big five trade unions, and they are concerned about what health and safety looks like for when their union members return to work. And I was wondering what the what the um, what the kind of clash is between you know folks wanting to expand their space again you know so to be able to go out more and between if i think of them as a kind of official you know regulatory bodies that are that are designed to look after you know members or or maybe organizations you know companies that have staff i wonder whether there'll be any friction between those those um you know the desires of those two kind of positions Mm. In, in in what sense sorry james so um the unions kind of looking after their staff the staff will want to kind of mix and that kind of thing and well i suppose i was thinking about it more in that so the union the unions of you know collectively want some sort of a you know a health and safety assessment so for that for the, so there would there, there would be you know health and safety you know plans risk assessments drawn up to ensure the safety of their members in whichever um you know industry they they work in um because of course i'm imagining that there's nobody would want to be on the receiving end of okay so we open it up then there's another you know another wave happens mm -hmm. and you know an organization you know trade unions have said okay we've agreed this is fine we we think this will work and then it doesn't you know, we we live in a in a kind of litigious society where you know blame and fault. So I wonder where I wonder whether there's a tension in that in that. I mean, I don't know because I'm not a I'm not part of a trade union, for example. But but there's a desire. Like I have a desire to want to go out more. You know, I want social interaction. John was saying about you know this is we're social animals, and I want more social interaction. And but I wonder whether there'll be a tension from from organizations like trade organizations or authorities which are saying well hold on a second we don't want to be i don't want to be held accountable until we know does that make sense yeah yeah i did hear that actually and that was one of the criticisms they were saying about this plan to roll roll back for restrictions um but it was coming mainly from trade unions and right. a few other places they were saying um that there's no kind of clear health and safety they were saying there was a lack of clarity over it basically i mean what does stay alert mean and all that kind of stuff and um i mean already you're seeing that there's some uh a disagreement between wales and scotland because wales and scotland are going to keep to the stay at home messaging whilst right. england is going to move to stay alert so yeah i mean i guess i guess it is a difficult um position to be in but i kind of I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement with the um, timing to start rolling it back because, um, well, I mean, going by the government figures, we've passed the peak anyway. Yeah. A lot of, of um, <clears throat> this was another theme that was coming up. There's been a lot of conflicting information about what the actual, well, there's been a lot of conflicting information in general, but w one of the areas of um, confusion was the actual, um, infection rates or the death rates like what the percentage was um because originally i think they said it was about 4.5 percent and in some places in america it's like less than one percent so there was the argument um saying are, are all these measures shutting down the economy and everything else that's hap happened worth it for uh, a virus which um you know, on the whole, the death rate doesn't kind of equate to the measures that have come into place. And um, I think this was going back to Trump, to what Trump was saying, where he said the solution can't be worse than the cure. So, so yeah, but I mean, I, I'm a, I, with the whole kind of mental health um, side of it, I've, I've kind of been getting a bit down with the measures and like finding it a bit hard and um recently this weekend i kind of went out to see my dad and some other family and stuff like that 
and it felt good to socialize again because it's the first time in a while um i mean we've got these zoom calls to socialize in and that's uh i mean it's a good weekly event to get people to come together but you need in in face human human contact as well right yeah it's a totally different experience and actually you're most of us are spending a disproportionate amount of our time with you know, a single group of people, or that might be one of the person or two of the people that we wouldn't usually spend all of our time with those people because there would be, <clears throat> we'd be going out and doing other things. And there's some, I think there's something really enriching about being able to, to spend time with people face to face. I mean, it's been, it's been useful and it's been, you know, rewarding to be able to have these Zoom meetings with friends and family and what have you, and you and use it. But it's it, you know, I think we're all missing proximity, like physical proximity with other people. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, John. No, no, no. I was going to say I, t- I totally agree. It's. Um... Yeah, it, I mean, I, it, I think it also depends on your current situation. I'm, I'm fortunate in that uh, Lucia is with me. But if you were completely on your own, yeah, it, it would be a lot harder, much, much harder. But that's, I mean, that's a, it's a perspective thing. Because I've talked about this with, um, with a, like a variety of friends about perspectives on this. And so, you know, one of my friends was saying the other day, you know, because for, you know, for a, a portion of this, lockdown for like nearly two months i was with Daddy to my partner in the studio flat and my friend was saying oh god i'm using i'm using you as an example of like of how difficult it could be being in such a small space and then i was saying well actually like it's just perspective because i think about you know a friend of mine that's got a couple of kids in one space i think that's probably quite challenging to to have to you know, school or homeschool in whatever format it's currently taking place and be in a space with children where you can't go out. That for me, I think is incredibly challenging. So I think, I, I don't know, I think we, and then I think being on your own, that must be incredibly challenging, much more challenging as well. So there's, there are so many different like layers of experience of people. And after this, I'm sure we'll hear hundreds and hundreds more of the things that people have, have lived through during this period of time. How have you found it in general, kind of being in a small, small apartment and sharing space and that kind of stuff? It's been really challenging. It's been really challenging at, at moments. Um, I think it's, it's, when we were talking about mental health, I think it raises, um, it raises things to the surface that, that may not, come up quite so quickly um, that are asking to be addressed. I was, I think that there is a, a degree of, of anxiety that, that begins to, to come about when being with one other person the whole time, because they're the, they end up being the complete mirror of everything you're doing each day. And so there's the, you know, there's your, the variety of being able to share with other people and not just have one person. Um, but then in a sense, it's also been really, there's been a real growth period as well of seeing another person's edges, you know, which, which, which I wouldn't have seen this year in, this, in the same way if, if this hadn't happened. So there are positives and there are negatives to it. Yeah. Are you on, I don't know, are you, are you on your own, Ryan? I, I'm, with, I'm with family at the moment, oh. so. Yeah, I've kind of been with my brother and, you know. How is it with family? Um, yeah, again, at times it's been challenging. Um, so, so some people have been in the house and other people haven't. So there's been a mi- mix around. But yeah, at times we've kind of found it difficult and we've had um, disagreements and that kind of stuff. But I mean... On, on, on the whole, I mean, it hasn't been that bad, but um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone's finding it difficult in whatever situation they're in. Yeah, I mean, my, my uh, 
my mum, she lives in Bournemouth. They moved, her and her, her boyfriend moved up there about seven or eight months ago. Um, and when they moved, the house was, they completely gutted it, you know, needed complete renovation. So I didn't really go to visit until it was done. So they had a bedroom, you know, a spare bedroom for me and everything. And when this first happened, my first reaction was, oh, I'll just go to Bournemouth and I'll just spend lockdown in Bournemouth. And then I, I spoke to my mum and I realised, I oh, know I can't because I can't risk, you know what I mean? If I, if I potentially have this virus, I don't want to take that to them. Yeah. You know, they're a bit older and that's people that could potentially be at risk. So I thought, oh yeah, I'll just go to Bournemouth and I'll, it's a good excuse to kind of spend a month or two with my mum. But then, yeah, realise, no, actually, I can't do that. So I will go. As soon as this whole thing is relaxed enough, I, you know, I will go, will go to visit. But that was something that I thought, oh, that would be nice, you know, just because when I went up there, it, it, it's a different energy when you're in that place. As soon as I got into Bournemouth, I instantly relaxed. When I got to my mum's house, I sat down on the sofa and I went, oh, I just felt this relaxation wash over me. And I think that's partly due to the fact that it's more it's more in nature that in Bournemouth and also just the energy of the place is different it's there's the stress levels of everybody are lower and I, I just felt it immediately so that was something that I really thought oh you know I'll just go there and it'll be nice spend a couple of months there and I, and I obviously haven't been able to do that but excuse me I'm looking forward to to going as soon as this is this is over it's that that's an interesting point about nature because, um, you know, David, my partner, he came back from California, for, was in Joshua Tree before this, you know, all, all kicked off, or just as this was lockdown was happening. And one of the things that he has kind of yearned for is space and nature, being in open space and nature. And it's a, and you can, when I look and when, we're, when I've been out, and seeing people, people, the kind of drive of people that people have to go to green spaces, because it's it's a different energetic feel. You know, it's 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 relaxing, and people want to go to places where they feel, you know, gentler, you know, softer. And of course, in somewhere like London, we live in a place that's that's we don't have such access to we don't have the access to nature in the same way that other people do that are you know outside in the country. So yeah, I totally get that. Um, I, I was going to say, I mean, London's got some really nice parks um, in the centre and some yeah. nice places to visit, but there, there is an atmosphere that is a lot more stressful in London. And it's something I've noticed when, when I've moved there and I've lived there before. Um, it's like, it, it, it's almost like a fog of, of, of stress that you get plopped into so yeah I can I can relate to what you guys are saying about getting away in nature and having a different energy and a different feel to it um, it's, London has this like you know I've been here for 11 years and I've also it has this kind of it's this um like tangible kind of low level tension yeah you know all the time and it's and it's and it's most predominant you can you can feel it in like when you're doing using public transport when you're going from one place to another because in london we get used to having to you've got to utilize time to the best of your ability because because time gets eaten up with traveling back and forth from places because that's how we operate and it's always there this kind of low level tension and then add lockdown and a global pandemic into that particular mix it's um well, I mean, perhaps it's surprising actually how well Londoners have done in this, given that, given that, the way in which we live in this city. So, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, so I haven't been to London. Um, I was there at the beginning of the outbreak when we first started getting a couple of sh cases coming from China around, um, I think it was around January, and that was when I was on the tube and I saw a couple of people using scarves as kind of make do face masks. Yeah. But um, looking at the images of London, it's, it, it looked completely empty, like in, in, in the central parts, like Trafalgar Square and places like that. Hmm. Yeah, I've got, I've got friends that live centrally. So their walk is where they can go and walk is central. Is central, you know, like 
Trafalgar Square, Leicester Square, you know, Pall Mall, that, those kind of places. And to see London deserted like that is, it's like in, in, incredible. It's incredible yeah. to, to look at it. I mean, never in your lifetime have you probably seen London to that extent. No. It's, it, 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 it mimics the beginning of that, um, that Danny Boyle film, 28 Days Later. Yeah. <laughs> Just thinking that, yeah. I, I remember and I read about that, that they, they filmed it at sort of four o'clock in the morning or something when, when there was no one around. Yeah. Yeah, that was what just popped into my head when you said that. Yeah, because it's weird. It's, to, to see a city, you, you never see a city, particularly a city, you know, major cities like London, you know, Paris, Milan, that, you know, they're kind of vibrant hubs. You never see them quiet ever because they never are. There's always stuff happening. There are always people on the streets. It's, you know, it's 24 seven. And to see it is kind of strange. It's kind of strangely beautiful and also it's like strangely eerie as well at the same time. Yep. But, um, has the, on, on that point, has the energy changed much um, since, since the COVID-19 broke out? Because we were saying like there's that low level, stressful um, kind of feel to London. So has it become more peaceful during COVID-19 or has it been around the same? Have you noticed a difference? I think because there's a lot of fear. So I think that it has and it hasn't it has in that pe- that there isn't an urgency for people to do things and get places yeah but there's a there's a level of fear that is around which is infectious just that that energy that everybody's or not everybody but a lot of people have and that you know that rubs off on you just being being in the same area as a bunch of people that are scared that definitely has an effect. It's, it's, um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, John, I agree. I think there's also a, I mean, my partner pointed this out, that there's something, there's something kind of interesting about being in a place like London where, where personal space, particularly when you're out and about, either in the streets or on public transport, personal, you know, personal space, you're kind of, if you, you know, your personal energetic bubble is frequently compromised because of the nature in which we travel. Suddenly, everyone is really mindful of space, mm. like of one another's space. It's like we're all kind of learning to see one another and be kind of, you know, energetically separate from one another for a while. And I wonder how much of that will translate as we, as we exit the lockdown and whether we see it, we, whether we see much of a continuation, whether we'll return to the way in which we, you know, we used to like pack onto tubes, you know, multiple, multiple people on the, in, on tube carriages crushed up against one another, or whether there'll be a shift in that as well. That's, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Whether, yeah, whether that, that whether we'll ever go back to that. I mean, we, we must do. It's, it's just because of the nature of, the city in that there's X number of people that go to work yeah, and there's X number of trains and there's rush hour and everybody's got to get home at the same time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. But then the, the flip side of that is that this, this, this period of time has also demonstrated how many people can, you know, can do jobs from home and how many meetings where, you know, before, yeah, we, it was understood that everybody needs to be sitting around a table for a meeting. Don't actually need to happen. And I think about, you know, a friend of mine with, with kids, how she's, you know, she's regularly come up against um, a conflict with, with employers around working from home so that she can also manage childcare. And actually now what this has proven is that so much of what she's able to do she doesn't it doesn't require her to travel into London and back out of London again so I wonder whether there'll also be a lot of people that say well hold on a second I've been doing this job from home for however long this will continue for and actually now we can 
you know, maybe I come in twice a week and whether that will then have an impact on the way in which we, you know, travel, you know, and transport works in London. Yeah. I mean, I think with the way technology is fit and, and also um, the things like, you know, Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Work Week, yeah. these kinds of ideas of where there are ways in which you don't need to be at a nine to five job in an office five days a week. There's, there's ways you can start to move towards having more free time. Yeah. So I think things were, were definitely moving in that way anyway. And with technology and, you know, the, for example, what we're doing right now, you can have conferences, you don't need to be face to face. Um, and yeah, maybe this whole situation would accelerate that. And, and also in terms of pollution with, with transport, yeah. yeah. You know, everybody driving and, and getting the train to work when actually maybe they don't need to, then they don't need to use their car that day. Then the, the um, cumulative effect of that, if, you know, if millions of people are doing that, will be less of a burden to the environment yeah. as well. Because we, you know, the, the way things are going, we, we having to already look at, switching you know cars are becoming electric and and all of these things because if we carry on doing what we're doing then we'll the, we're depleting the planet's resources to a point where we've got to a point now where if we don't make a change then it will be too late yeah yeah maybe this is a good op um a good op uh opportunity to awaken to um the fact that we do need to kind of like make that change to 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 more renewable energies because uh i think elon musk was saying we've got 20 to 25 years like we need to replace most of the cars on the planet to so to have 80 percent of them running on electric or something that is renewable um otherwise we're playing a very dangerous game with um, the environment and <clears throat> I think this this whole lockdown situation will probably have a lot of environmental implications as well because we'll look at how many how much um, less CO two and other gases we're pumping into the atmosphere and the ecological effects of that. I tell you something I noticed the other night when Lucia and I were out for a walk. The sky was so clear. Both of us remarked at how i'd never seen the sky so clear in this country it felt like being abroad you know like when you go to, i don't know you go to spain or, or wherever you go and, and it's it's a hot country and the sky at night is sort of dusk and it's just beautiful it's blue and we you know we only went for a walk up to the supermarket but a because the weather's brightened up and b because of the sky it felt like we were on holiday we both said that. It feels like we're, you know, we've gone on holiday. And I, I've never seen the sky so clear in, in the UK. And that's obviously because of the situation and, you know, industry shut down, less people using their cars. And, yeah, it was beautiful. Really nice to see that. Well, we've seen, in London, we've seen massive drops, haven't we, in the level of pollution. And, you know, there are, there are numerous hot spots throughout London where... You know, it's been on the it's been on the agenda. You know, for the for the mayor of London to address those pollution hotspots, and we've seen you know you know huge decreases in the level of air pollution over this period of time. And I hope that that's something that we are something that we carry that we carry out of this as a benefit for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, on, on, on that point, or just moving forward, how do you see things kind of going um, in terms of, because we're not going to go back to quote unquote normal, there's going to be a new normal, and there's going to be these restrictions in place. So, um, I mean, how, how, how do you see it kind of progressing from, from this point on? Do you mean logistically? logistically and kind of, well yeah with social distancing and all these measures and um with with the economy as a whole because um 
I've like for for example, I've I've been when I've been in London during rush hour, it's a nightmare, and you can't get on the tube. So I've I've, I've been on um, in in situations where I've had to wait for five trains to pass on the subway uh, around to get to work for nine o'clock, and um, I'm I'm just wondering if that will change, and you you'll have a situation where people are kind of working more variable hours. So it's not necessarily a nine to five. Some people come into work earlier, some people leave later and it's more kind of um, balanced out, I would say. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, that's one implication, but yeah, logistically and economically and socially and, you know. Well, I hope, I mean, I, I hope that there is a, there is something that comes out of it that's about the notion of productivity. Like what does productivity mean? Because it's something that's come up in a number of conversations that I've had with people around not feeling productive enough in this moment in time. And, and I'm wondering whether what productive was before was actually a positive beneficial thing or whether it was just what we were used to so when you're talking about nine to five this kind of standard way of living which is which you know other i mean i think scandinavia have explored the notion of you know a four-day working week for a long time and it, it is as productive but it allows people greater time for their own personal lives i hope that there's a there's a more informed discussion about what productivity can look like and how that takes place. And then that, that gives, it's, it can be beneficial to, you know, working from home can be beneficial to people that have, you know, children. And so it, it gives a great, you know, it affords potentially more people opportunity than, than the standard nine to five, which is limiting for a lot of people that can't do that. I, I would think it would be uh, harder to work from home with children to, to be honest, but yeah. No, but I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's less about having the kids at home. It's about the being able to get it's in London. When, if you're, if two hours of your day is traveling mm. and then you've got to, and a children's, you know, if school finishes at four, so you've got, if you, if you don't have travel, you can work from home do nine till four and finish and be, and be available for your family life rather than, you know, there's a cost burden on, on families that have to employ someone to look after their kids, for example, which may change. That's definitely something to factor in. I mean, I, you know, I worked, I did office work for 10 years and the first job that I worked at was, uh, near Liverpool Street and from where I lived it was only 20 minutes on the tube so sort of half an hour door to door but then the second job that I did was in the Queen's Park area and that was over an hour door to door and it really really took it out of me like over two, two, two and a half hours a day of a commute is just draining and such a waste of time yeah. really you think about that whilst that's 14 hours or whatever, uh, what would that be, 17, 17 and a half hours over the course of a week, which is a long time. It's nearly a whole day you spend on the tube. Yeah. Which is ridiculous, actually. I think about, well, I lived in Manchester before I lived here. And in Manchester, even when I was working, you know, a, you know, nine to five or 10 to six or, you know, whatever format of job, I mean, and this is about size, you know, I could be, I could be home by like quarter past five. And then that gave me an entire evening to see friends, you know, to, to cook, to relax, to socialize. And that, I mean, that changes the quality of, of life. And London, the quality of life is often the, I mean, I've noticed, you know, I noticed as soon as I wrote quality of life, it kind of revolves around in London, you're most often asked either, where do you live? What do you do? 
and you're you know you're kind of defined by the thing that you do less even if the thing that you do eats up your life to an extent that where you you have less of a personal life and that just is eventually a little bit soul destroying mm. anything that challenges us you know that, those kind of status quos i think would be a would be a wonderful thing difference between working to live and living to work exactly which, which is yeah i mean that's one of the one of the reasons that i got out of working in an office was well i just got to the point where i wasn't enjoying it anymore at all i, I started to hate it and it eats up so much of your time that you spend more time there than you do anywhere else. And if you're doing something you don't particularly enjoy, it's, it's a prison sentence. Yeah. And I was, I'm so glad and, and feel very fortunate that I found a way out, which at the time was playing poker for a living. Um, and I remember the freedom I felt when I, when I quit, you know, and, and, and the first year after, after um, quitting my job, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't relish what I was doing. You know, really the, the novelty, it took a long time to wear off. I mean, I've given up, it's been, that was 13, 12, well, 13 years ago now. Um, so the novelty has worn off. I've got used to working in the way that I do now, which is, you know, I'm still work. I, I you know, I work with, you know, doing the, the, the Cambo and doing some behind the scenes stuff, but I'm not, I'm not commuting to an office every day which I did for 10 years. So the, yeah, the freedom that I felt when I packed it all in and sort of started a new life was brilliant. I mean, it was just so good. So all my time was my own. Yeah. Like I do what I want to do when I want to do it without anybody telling me what to do. And yeah, it was wonderful. Wonderful. But, but that's because I was doing something I didn't enjoy. If you, if you have a job that you're really passionate about, and you commute to work and you love it, what you do, and you, you relish going in to do this job, then, then that's a different thing. But when it's something that you don't enjoy, then it sucks the life out of you. Yeah. Was it, were, were you passionate about it in the beginning? Did you enjoy uh, it first? No, the, when I first, the first company I worked for, I enjoyed it a lot more. A, because it was all new. I was, uh, you know, 17 year old kid going into work and it was exciting and you know i was working in the city so there was that aspect to it and i like really like the people there and i and i did i did really enjoy it plus the commute wasn't too long um but then unfortunately the company got bought out after five years and then there was a lot of redundancies and i got made redundant and with the second job that i did it was uh working a lot further away which was which really killed it uh, it's not as nice an area like working in the city is just it's buzzing and it's you know it's happening and working further out just didn't have that and also I got to a point where I wasn't growing within the role I was just doing the same thing and I wasn't ever going to going to progress which is you know you can't you always need to feel like you're working towards something mm. and I didn't I felt stagnant and I wasn't enjoying what I was doing anymore. And it got to the point where I just, I would dread going in. The alarm would go off in the morning and I'd, I'd just be like, I can't believe I've got to go and spend all day at this place. Um, and it, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It was a good company, you know, a successful company. I just got to the point where I just didn't want to do it anymore. And yeah, I just, it, poker was, was something that got me out of it. It's not something I do anymore. I do, Cause although I, I did love poker, playing online poker uh, for somebody like me, then it becomes an all-consuming obsession. So I just swapped the job for sitting in front of a computer playing online poker all day, which wasn't particularly healthy for me, but it was a transition. It was a way for me to get out of the rat race. And I'm very um, grateful to that. But then eventually for me to grow as a person, I had to let go of poker because poker is very difficult to have balance because it's also, there's an addictive quality to it. So when you play poker and you're doing it all the time, and this goes back to dopamine, we've talked about this before. Yeah. When you're playing online poker, it's the same as scrolling on your phone, it's the same as taking cocaine. It's firing yeah. off that dopamine and you, but you get used to a higher level of dopamine and then you don't want to do anything else. You don't want to socialize, you don't want to do things because 
but it's not giving you the hit that poker gives you. I just want to play a poker tournament rather than see my friends. So if you have, if you're somebody that struggles to live in balance, which is, which is a issue that, you know, I, I have had, then being a professional online poker player isn't the best job for you. Although the most successful poker players are like that because when you, any, anybody who's at the top of their field, you have to be obsessive. You look at any top sports person, they don't live a normal life. You know, if somebody's the, the, the best tennis player in the world, they, they haven't lived a normal life to get to that level. They've, they've sacrificed a lot to get there. Um, so it kind of goes hand in hand. <laughs> if you want to be the best at something, you're going to have to give up something yeah. and be completely obsessed with the thing that you're doing to get to become that good at it. And I have that kind of personality in that I, I find something that I like and then I do it to death at the exclusion of everything else, which is what I think most people that are at the top of their game in whatever it is, whether it's sports or even musicians, you have to put the hours in and and have a have an obsession for the thing that you're doing yeah i mean go, go, going back to what you were saying about le leaving the corporate uh rat race um i feel like a lot of people i've spoken to well in general but um also at the the people who attend the planet cambo events they're kind of in in, in that similar situation where they that they're working a city job or a corporate job or something along those lines. And, um, you know, the, the, they like the people there, but they, they're, they're not interested in the job in doing a nine to five and doing the conventional kind of standard job. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I think that's a big trend at the moment where a lot of people are in these kind of corporate, well, not just corporate jobs, but government jobs as well. And um, they're looking to get out of it um, and do something more meaningful. Yeah, I mean, one, two things I'll say. One is when you're at work, as I said, you spend more time there than you do at home or with your family and friends. And the people that you work with, you don't choose them for the most part. Maybe there are some situations in work where you can choose but you can't you're forced into working with people that you can't like with friends you can you can kind of choose you know what i mean if someone's if you don't like someone you just stop socializing with them but with work you you're forced into being with these people all the time and if there's negative people in your workplace that that is something something that can really bring you down and there's not a lot you can do about it really um, so that was the first point. And the second point is that as people wake up, if everybody was, was really awake, the capitalist regime that we're under would fall. People would realize what the hell am I doing? I'm chasing, I'm chasing some imaginary carrot that's being dangled in front of me in the future that doesn't exist to get money, to buy things that I don't need you know, the consumer, um, what's the word? I can't think of the word, but you know, I'm, I'm a consumer. Yeah. yeah, the consumer culture. It's like, well, uh, it's mentioned in Fight Club, isn't it? I can't, I forget the actual quote, but yeah, you, it mentioned it in Fight Club. You are not your car keys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically earning money to buy, to, to, like striving to earn money to buy things that you don't actually need, when actually the most important thing is, is your time, not your money. Yeah. So, People that are successful, very successful, entrepreneurs, millionaires, billionaires, whatever, if you've done something that you enjoy and your time has been spent well to get there, then fantastic. But if you've worked all hours of the day and you, you're still working all hours of the day, even though you've got all this money and, you're, and it's, it's not making you happy, you've wasted your life. You've literally wasted your life. Like the money doesn't... Money... You know, if you're rich, yes, you have options and, and, and um, that's really what it's about is, is you have more options. But true happiness will come from spending your time doing something that you love. Mm. That's the, the, the richest man in the world is the man that spends all of his time happy doing something that he loves. 
Whereas you can have someone who's a billionaire who is under tremendous amounts of stress, doesn't really enjoy his work, but he's just chasing the money. Then it becomes an irony because um, the, the money is there to give you options, but you're, 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 the, the options you've made or the decisions you've made are ones that are making you unhappy. So you've got all these resources, but you're not using them effectively. That's right. You, so, it, I mean, this is very, this will be very common amongst rich people is they, they'll get to a point where they've made it. They've got enough money where they can live very comfortably now for the rest of their life and not need to carry on in the way they've been carrying on, but they still carry on because it's seeking. It's, 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 it's that human nature of seeking, which is spiritual seeking, seeking happiness in money and objects, this it's seeking. And that's why a lot of people have a midlife crisis. A lot of wealthy people get to their, you know, to their midlife and then they're like, Oh my God, I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm in a relationship that I'm not happy about. I'm, I'm, I've, I've wasted all those years. Yeah. I've got loads of money and I've got the flash car and I've got the nice house, but I'm not happy. Um, and I'm, I, I'm not claiming to have the answer or saying that I'm super happy, but you know, I've read books and, and just generally absorbed information about this. And that's why a lot of these people turn to spirituality and non-duality because they're searching for happiness in external things. Mm. And each external thing will only make you happy temporarily. And there's a very good quote by, I love this quote, by Rupert Spira, who's a, a non-duality speaker online. And he said that we, you know, we're searching for happiness in these objects. So when you're a five-year-old kid and you get given an ice cream, it makes you happy temporarily. And then as you get older, like, you know, a little bit older, you get given a toy, whatever, a fire truck, it makes you happy. And then you get in the football team when you're a teenager, that makes you happy. Then you get your first girlfriend, that makes you happy. And what happens is you associate the happiness with the objects. And the, ha the, the ice cream happiness is the same as the fire truck happiness, which is the same as the football team happiness, which is the same as the relationship happiness. The happiness is not different. It's the same happiness. And what he says is that, when you get given the object, the happiness is not in the object. What happens is you stop seeking when you get given that object and the happiness that you naturally are suddenly is not obscured anymore. So the happiness that you feel is your, it's your own, it's you as, as that happiness. And that's where the happiness comes from. It's not because you've been given the object. It's because you're not looking anymore. You're not seeking. So the clouds that were in front of the sun, so to speak, have been lifted and the happiness that you naturally are starts to shine through and then it gets obscured again when you start searching for happiness and i've had moments in meditation and you know other things where i've had this had it on vipassana as well where i suddenly i'm just happy for no reason i don't need anything and i actually had this um when i made that video i made a video recently for planet cambo about how i got my groove back with meditation and that evening I'd done, I'd done some yoga. I did, I did whatever I did, a half an hour, an hour of power yoga, and I meditated, and it really clicked. I really hit that space where it was just blissful, peaceful feeling. And I, as I was sitting there, I thought to myself, all my external circumstances would make no difference to this right now. If I had a million pounds in the bank or I was broke, it, would, it wouldn't change where I am right now, this feeling. And this feeling, that piece of just contentment and not needing anything is worth more than it. it was the most valuable thing that I could have. And all the money in the bank or living in a posh mansion or whatever couldn't touch that. It's almost irrelevant, like completely irrelevant in relation to that feeling. And in that moment, I realized that's what I need to be focusing on is, is living in that, in that state of release. Uh, and not chasing money, although you know that I have it was it hasn't lasted. You know what I mean? It's it's I, I'm still meditating, but it but it it's work in progress. So I'm still flipping back between that. But that it was a quite a big realization in that moment. I was just sitting there, just thinking, I don't need anything. There's nothing, nothing that I need that any money could give me right now. Sitting here, feeling this feeling in this peaceful state, and. Yeah, that's what life's all about. 
But at the same time, we do live in a physical world and there are needs and necessities. So it's, it's kind of this um, walking this uh, fine line between kind of doing, trying to live in that state of contentment whilst also uh, meeting our, the, our needs and necessities. So you can't just go and live in a cave and we could, but you know what I mean? There, there are some yeah. people that do, but ultimately you still got a function in the world. So it's about finding the balance, mm. but and p definitely doing something that you enjoy is a huge part of that. If you do something you hate or it's very stressful, you're not going to be able to get, you're, you're going to find it very difficult to come out of a day of work and then switch off and, and be in that state. It will be very, extremely difficult. So doing something that you, you're passionate about and that you enjoy, it will feed into that meditative state and will feed into your meditation. And I mean, that, that's what life's about. It's about mm. finding something, finding your vocation. What were you put here to do? Mm. What's your skill? What's your uh, dharma? I think is that the right word? What's your dharma? Yeah, yeah. And, and that needs to be something that's for the greater good and that's aligned with truth. And when you do that and you, you, you have gratitude, then the universe will pave the way for, for you to be successful. And if that means that you'll get money for, you know, if that means that you need money to do that, then the money will come. And that's, that's really what the law of attraction is. It's not just visualizing money. It's finding something that you enjoy and you're passionate about that's for the greater good. That's not a selfish thing. Like, so for example, with the poker, as much as I loved it, it's a very selfish endeavor. It didn't benefit anybody other than me was making money playing poker. So you've got to find something that, that you do that somehow benefits you and other people that you enjoy, that you're passionate about, and then focus on doing what you love and the rest will take care of itself because that's the way, that's the way it works. <laughs> The universe is set up like that for the for the for the um, benefit of the greater good. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've spent time doing jobs and projects that I didn't enjoy, and uh, yeah, you get stressed out, and there's nothing worse, really. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, to have something that you at least have some interest in, or you can see it kind of progressing to where you want to take it that, that, that's really what it's about and um what you're remunerated or the compensation for that doesn't really matter as much as um you know the the, the state you bring to uh, what you're doing yeah like since i quit my job in in 2007 i've not had what you would call a, a secure job so i was a professional poker player and i've done a couple of other things and now i'm doing doing the cambo and all of the things that I've done has been what I want to do and something that I enjoy. And at no point during that time have I had a fixed income. Like with poker, it's not fixed. You know what I mean? You, 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 you earn and you lose and you earn, you lose, but you make money over time. And the other things I've done, even with the Cambo now, um, it's not, you know, that, what, what David, my business partner and I are doing is we put all our money, we kind of most of it goes back into the company. So, but at no point during those 12 years have I run out of money. I just, the universe just provides, you know, to the point where I try not to worry about it. You know, it just, whenever you, whatever I need, it will be there. And I think when you can fully, fully let go and surrender into that, which I haven't fully done, I mean, worries and fears do come up. But I think when you can do that, that is where you literally have hacked the game. If you know what I mean? Yeah. You've hacked it. But it, it's not something that you can do like, oh, yeah, I don't care. You have to really not care. You have to really let go of just being okay with, with whatever's happening because you trust that the universe has got you, got your back. And when I think once you fully do that and you fully let go, then abundance will come in a big way, in a, in a very big way. There, there's an interesting book I read called Busting Loose from the Money Game. I don't know if you've heard of it that I read a few years ago. And, that, and that's basically what that book is about, what I'm talking about, about there's a process you can do of how to, you can let go of, uh, of money and understand that money 
is a game and it's, it's, it has rules in the same way as football has rules and you can actually break free from it in, a, in an energetic way, like more than just in a physical way. You can energetically break free from money. And when you do, suddenly life will become miraculous. Money just starts coming out of, you know, coming everywhere without you having to do anything. And it sounds, you know, airy fairy and, and nuts, but really it's the law of attraction. It's the same thing. Whether you believe in that or not, it's another story. I'm just, you know, just, it's an interesting book. I'd recommend it. I would recommend that, that uh, if you, you know, that you read it because it's definitely a different perspective on, on money. I, th I think there's a lot of misconceptions around the law of attraction and uh, the way you've just explained it is, uh, m makes more sense than, I guess, the way it's uh, put, put out there generally or the way, you, you, yeah, like the, the it, if you're going to have the meme of what the law of attraction is, it's just generally like, um, oh, if you just think of something, um, for long enough or if you're passionate about something for long enough then it just appears but the way you've explained it is uh makes more sense yeah you got it. it's about finding it's about love like do do what you love that will resonate with the universe and if it's for the greater good the universe will pave the way will literally lay the paving stones in front of you for you to get to where you need to go and with that will come money if you need it it won't and if you don't need it it won't it will just give you whatever you need to make that happen because that's the way that's the way the universe is kind of programmed is for the greater good so as long once you find your niche and you find the thing your dharma and you and you do it and that's what you focus on is the passion and the love for what you're doing not the money then the money will naturally come anyway and that that for me is really what the law of attraction is it sounds easy it sounds easy on paper and but it's obviously not we've all you know we all worry and stress and and to the letting go the really the letting go and the trusting is is difficult because to to, to fully let go you have to accept that you're not in control and when you're not in control then what will i do if something really bad happens that's it it's getting over that it's getting over the fact that something really bad could happen. And if it does, then it was what was supposed to happen. And there's another book I read that's just come to mind years ago. Uh, I think it's called The Art of Happiness or something like that. It's a short book. And it just says that if you accept that everything that happens, happens to you or is happening, is for the greatest good, that's happiness. No matter what happens, it was meant to happen. And it was for, for the best. Was all, everything that happens is for the best, regardless of what happens. So even if something terrible happens, the way you should frame that is, I can't wait to see how this is going to benefit me. Now, obviously, you can come up with some really, you know, extreme situations where you think, well, how could this possibly be good? And it gives some examples in the book. But again, that's about trust and about surrender. But to, it takes work. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's one thing to yeah. say, oh, yeah, I trust and I'm just going to relax and surrender. And it's another thing to actually do it we've we've gone off on a tangent there but, but um i was gonna say like I, I there's probably quite a lot of people right now who are in that boat after this whole crisis has come into play because a lot of jobs you know are changing or maybe not going to be there and um there's probably a lot of people kind of worried about what we've just been talking about so it's a good topic to cover what are uh, I'm I'm interested here James's thoughts on uh, the topic. On what, on the law of attraction. Well, yeah, or just generally what we've been talking about, like getting out of careers you're not passionate about and stuff like that. Uh, well, um, I, I also I left. Um, I used to work in the the charity sector, so in NGOs, and I there was a point at which I left. I walked away from it, and I was like, I'm not doing. I'm not working in a and an office and I didn't used to do a lot. I mean, I did, I did service delivery. So I wasn't so office, you know, focused. I was out and about meeting people, delivering services for X, Y, and Z. But I, I, um, I didn't trust my, my gut said that we're done now here. And I didn't trust. And I went back for one last job 
um, with a charity. Um, and I can remember being there. And there were lovely people, nice people, great ethos, you know, great, you know, reason to exist. But I was, I knew that I was not, I was not, I was not nurturing the part of myself that wished to be nurtured. And, and I had gone against what my intuition and my gut was telling me, which was to return into something because it felt safer and more stable. And actually when I left there and I've, and since I left there, I've been freelance. And, and as John says, or John said, at no point have I, I've always had money. And, and I've done things that I really enjoy. And I've had loads of time for myself. And it doesn't mean I've always had loads of money, not at all. Mm. But I've always had enough to just to be able to do everything that I need to do. So, and actually now, I'm much more interested and focused in on that, the thing that's, that it's the thing that brings me life. And yeah. I have had that previously in jobs. I have totally, you know, I used to, I worked in many services where they gave me tremendous joy and purpose, but it, but it ended. <clears throat> and now that, you know, the call, the vocation is something else. Yeah, and there, uh, there was a non-duality teacher that I used to speak to. And we talked about money. And one thing he said to me, he said, have you got, how much money have you got in your wallet right now? And I, whatever was in there, I counted it. And I told him, and he said, that's all you need. Right now, that's all the money you need. You don't need anything more than that in this moment, right here and right now. And a lot of the, the thing with money is money is, is, is tied to time. It's tied to something that I'm going to do with the money in the future. I need the money to, to, to get somewhere to do something which is based on there being a real thing called the future that exists. And that will take you away from where you are right now. And what you said made sense is like, right now, is there a problem? Let's just say right now I was worrying about money because I'm, the reason I'm worrying about money is because it's to do with a future event. At some point in the future, I'm going to have no money and that's going to be bad. Yeah. But that's, a conceptualization of something that isn't real. It's, it's not what's happening right now. I'm not saying don't, don't have plans, but you know, look in your wallet, how much money you got in your wallet right now, right now at this moment, that is all you need. You don't need any more money than that because if you did, you'd have it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I, th I think we're also like, there's so much conditioning around money and jobs and, um, when it comes to career decisions, like money plays such such a factor in people's decisions when it comes to get, getting the job and stuff like that. And it's, <clears throat> it almost, it, I mean, it blindsides you basically in, into do, doing something for the wrong reason, in my, in my opinion. Like it, 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 if, if money is the factor that is going to change something, I mean, all, all other things equal, if you've got a better opportunity and you enjoy it and all that kind of stuff and it's more money, then great. But um, if, if, if you're taking a job just because it's more money, um, like uh, from, from, from personal experience and a lot of people I've spoken to, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people get burned when they take that option. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. It's much better to earn less money and do the thing that you love and have more time than it is to earn more money and be tied to a job that you don't enjoy as much or a workload that you can't handle or stress that you don't need. For sure. Because again, the money, and this is, we're going to go down another route now. Maybe we should save this for another podcast, but money is a concept. <laughs> It doesn't, it, it's pieces of paper that have some value that we've assigned to it. It doesn't actually have any real value in of itself. It's a conceptual framework that we operate within. Um, and that is also tied into time, which is also a conceptual framework that we operate in. Both of these things, money and time, only exist in, in the mind of a human being. <laughs> They don't actually exist in reality as real tangible things other than pieces of paper and time is abstract. It's an abstract conceptual framework. Um, and it doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't take it with you. Yeah. No one's getting out of here alive. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank when you're dead, you ain't taking it with you. So it's, it's almost like it's the nature of the separate self or the ego to be completely focused on money and time because it lives in money and time. It operates in money and time. That's the separate self exists as a concept in time and time itself is a concept. It, it's like, if you get into like the, you know, the now and, and, and the non-duality of, of, of that side of it and that right now, right here, there is no separate self. It only exists in the future or the past as you uh, conceptualize it then you see that it, the, the separate self lives in the world of money and time, trying to accumulate money to add to itself, money, objects, things, to add to itself, to make itself better. That's how it operates. It's how, what can I do to make myself better? What can I do to add more to this to make it better? That's the activity of the separate self. Yeah. And, it, and, to, and it will do that in time. And it's, uh, I mean, the ego is trying to always control, you know, reality and be in control as well. So it feeds into what you were saying, where you just had to kind of like learn to trust a lot more and, and that kind of. Um... Totally. And that was before I even knew about, you know, non-duality and enlightenment and all that business. It just happened. It just happened. And somehow I ended up doing what I'm doing. But I realize now I was always meant to do this. Everything that happened to me led me to where I am now, which was to be doing this, you know, with Planet Cambo and what we're doing. This was always going to be my vocation. It was never going to be poker. It was never going to be sitting in front of a desk. So I actually, I never had any control anyway. <laughs> mm. yeah. All those decisions that were made, I didn't really make them. They just happened. I mean, that, that gets into uh, the argument of free will and determinism, which we'll save for another podcast. We'll save it for another one because yeah. that, yeah, we're already starting to veer off. <laughs> but um, no, it's been, in, it's, it's interesting uh, to talk about these things. Cool. All right. I think we, should, we could probably leave it there. It's been uh, about an hour and 15, I think now. So yeah. Yeah. not enough. I think we've given the listeners enough now. They've got enough value out of one podcast. <laughs> well, they've, they've started falling asleep, so we'll let them rest and then we'll be back next week. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Both. Thank you and, yeah, uh, great. Thank you. Oh, okay. Hang on. Stop recording. <laughs>